Hello everyone, and welcome back to the penultimate dev diary for Hearts of Iron 4 Trials of Allegiance, this week talking about Alt History Brazil. The very first dev diary we saw covered the non-aligned historical path, but today we're going to be going over some fasch, some monarchism, some democracy, and some communism all to boot. So let us not linger any further on this screen and go straight into the dev diary. We begin by getting a short tidbit by AVB, talking about how this dev diary won't necessarily be showing everything, but really focusing on the core ideas of what each branch is going to deliver you, as well as some of the nice little nuggets and more flavorful things to talk about. With that, we also get to see a non-pixelated, actually clear to read version of the focus tree, where we can see the communist section very clearly defined, um, completely separate, not connected to anything else. We also see the Democrat and the monarchist branches um, next to each other, but not necessarily at all connected until we get down to the two diplomacy paths, the foreign policy, which are of course the, where the meat of content really lies. And then on the last, we see the integralist fash path, which is actually where today's dev diary is going to begin. To get some backstory to the integralist path, we begin by learning about how the focus tree models Brazil after a similar mirror style to Italy in this time period, where instead of having the black shirts, you're going to have the green shirts, and you're also going to really reform yourselves over some sort of idyllic, Christian cultural nationalist identity. In addition to that, you will also be following a similar path to the non-aligned, where there will be some overlap with the focuses, as both sides did try to cozy up to one another to try and make it through this period. So taking a look at the focus exactly, instead of going down the left historical path, we are going right with work with the integralists, which is going to start you ticking with some daily flash support. In addition to that, you're also going to have on-map decisions where you have percentage chances of increasing flash support in those specific states. You may remember this path being somewhat similar to what Britain has, with the rally the black shirts before you eventually march on Downing Street, where you'll get varying amounts of support depending on some percentage chances. Once you eventually have enough support after taking those decisions, you can forsake taking Estado Novo and instead go for Estado Moderno. In this, your ideology is going to change, but you're not going to lose your leader. Vargas is going to be sticking around and just going to become the figurehead of the far-right party. Ah yes, Integralist Brazil, your time is now. So with the government in check, the next focus is going to involve the military, with really trying to get those green shirts up to snuff. As we can see in the Anawe, he says, uncertain of how to say it, you can get a national spirit which gives you good attack and defense on core territory. It also unlocks a series of decisions you can take to start recruiting Integralist militias in all the different states. So basically a sort of rapid militarization spawning divisions kind of focus. And there we can see the green shirt wearing a what looks to be green shirt. Actually, is he wearing an armband, like an integralist armband? <laughs> oh no. The dev diary also shows us Gustavo here as a potential advisor who actually gives with recruitable population 1.5, not bad buffs. The war support is nothing to be scoffed at. And military factory construction speed? Yeah, um, uh, I think I'm taking Gustavo. As you continue to solidify your control over Integralist Brazil, you will eventually come to a choice, whether you want to keep Vargas in his kind of balancing the fine line position, or if you want to fully commit and oust him for somebody else. Choosing to go in Vargas we trust will, of course, trust in Vargas, thus you're keeping him around, so he'll get the trait Reluctant Integralist, which gives him some more support, but he is reluctant, so political power gain is going to be on the decline which is unfortunate because he used to be giving you political power gain. So that's technically minus 20% political power gain. That's, that's kind of rough. Or of course you can forsake him and go for somebody who's probably much more favorable for the position, Mr. Salgado over here. Regardless of who you choose, you will eventually find yourself at the bottom of the tree, at which point you have the Domination for South America sub-branch which you can access. Conveniently, we actually get a nice subsection talking about the specific Domination of South America sub-branch which is effectively one of the two foreign policy branches. At sort of a passing glance, it seems to be divided into three core sections, um, working with Germany to get some tanks and submarines, working with Italy to get some aircraft and, I guess, trucks, and finally the one on the right is going to be the conquest focuses, basically attacking the entirety of South America before heading north. This all culminates at the bottom, of course, with America de Sol, the central formable nation that you're going to be aiming for. Having a gander now at some of the focuses you're going to have access to, we see South Atlantic Domination, which at the start gives you some naval bases and dockyards, which is good, 
but much more interestingly, you gain claims on islands in the South Atlantic Ocean, you gain 10 German submarines, and many of your naval officers gain Seawolf. So very much so aiming for like a covert naval gameplay, you also gain claims on the islands. So what's that going to be? That's going to be like the Falklands, St. Helena, I think. Does it also include like the um, African island? I truly have no idea if Equatorial Guinea is going to be up for grabs with this focus, but maybe, maybe. Going down the Italy path, however, gives you the Italian-Brazilian partition of Africa, in which you're effectively going to get claims on 20 different states in Africa. So I, yeah, you're definitely going to be getting some claims in Africa, it seems. This also comes with some buffs towards fighting in forests, which are useful for some of your generals, but it seems to be that the core utility here is going to be with joining the Axis and then making sure you can claim this territory in the peace deal. And then finally at the bottom, we see the formable America de Sul. You will be known as America de Sul and you gain decisions to call own territory in South America. Behold here, of course, the two rival Americas, North and South. There is just a small tidbit at the top that says that as you continue to grow, you're going to gain the ire of the United States for a multitude of transgressions. So there may be an intercontinental war. I don't know if this is just some flavorful like additional text or if there's actually going to be a mechanic where the more states you conquer in South America, the more the United States is maybe going to feel infringed to maybe stop you. Hard to say, but I mean, they're not going to do anything, right? If getting into an intercontinental war doesn't seem your interest, we have the focus for Mercosul, where you can create the faction of Mercosul and start inviting other South American nations to join by decision. Unfortunately, I can only think of two nations, which is Peru and Venezuela, which are likely to join your Fash faction. So unless there's other ways for you to like boost them more easily, this might have limited utility. Hard to say. Monarchism, monarchism, monarchism. The people love monarchism. So this branch begins with trying to rally the opposition to Vargas, who initiated the state of emergency, by really just coming together and demanding its secession which also gets rid of that communism support, which is um, good if you're going down a monarchist path. And instead of following the historical path of trying to fix Brazil with Vargas, you're instead going to undermine him by romanticizing some imperial history and really get the, the idea of bringing back the monarchy into swing. Following in the footsteps of the integralist path, there is also a choice between which monarch you want to choose between, be it a king called Pedro or a king called Pedro. Oh, they're both called Pedro. Okay, be it a king called Alcantara or a king called Henrique, the choice is up to you. Alcantara's claim seems to be rooted in that he once renounced his claim to the frame, but is now trying to illegitimize that former renunciation and come back, which gives him some interesting buffs, the vision speed and air accident chance going up. I'm sure there must be some law behind that, but I haven't the mind to know. Or alternatively, we have Henrique, or is it Henrique? I couldn't say who is the much more straightforward approach of returning the royal family, in which you get trade lord cost reduction down, economy lord cost down. Yeah, these are much more basic buffs, but equally pretty more like generally useful. I'm not sure how much impact 2% division speed really has. It's, it's, it's very small. With the monarchy back, but not quite in power, you'll find yourself in a constitutional monarchy. This is the point where you've kind of got some middle ground, where you decide to focus on other things, or you can decide to go all the way and go for an absolutist monarchy, following the centre path of undermining the National Congress and utilising national security law. With enough undermining complete, however, you can eventually succeed, tear down the democratic apparatus and declare the Empire of Brazil under whichever monarch you've chosen to go with. With all the pieces in place, the final section of this focus tree branch is going to be about really solidifying your position with the monarchy because even though you've gained power, it doesn't necessarily mean the people are on your side. So that's probably something you're going to want to deal with. There is also the addition to use penal battalions, which could be quite interesting. Just um, conscripting prisoners to fight for you. Not really sure how loyal they're going to be in the front lines, but you know, you can do it. As well as demanding a restoration with Portugal, whether it be gaining back their colonies or just going after them in their entirety, and restoring Brazilian honour. With honour restored in Brazil, the people will be far less critical of your government. So war support goes up, division attack goes up, regrettable population factor goes up, even the separatist sentiments are all gone. Things are genuinely on the rise. Oh, and you also get a cheeky Brazilian Portugal if you want, um, which could be useful if you wanted to do a, a quick conquest into Spain and then really be a part of the European conflict. 
This is super interesting to me because Monarchy has access to both the Dominate the South America branch, where they conquer the entirety of South America, or the collaborating, collaborating with the Allies branch, which means you can effectively, you know, go to Portugal, maybe even go after Spain, and still join the Allies and be like a central leading figure in the Allies. It seems that Pedro Henrique over here has quite the few options at his disposal. I guess the only thing I'm kind of disappointed about, um, which I was hoping could, I mean, maybe it still happens, we don't see everything in the Dev Diary, but there was no mention of the Fifth Empire. I feel like there could have been an opportunity here to, if you're going to Portugal and you're kind of pushing for this global um, coverage, this global strength, you could maybe become the inheritors of the Fifth Empire and really go on a far more um, dominatory conquest styled victory. I don't know, I think Brazil is strong enough to kind of solo the entire world, especially when they have access to the conquering South America and uniting everything under cause they could probably take up the mantle of the Fifth Empire. So that's two ideologies done, two ideologies left to go, and next on the chopping block is the democratic path. So while we were trying to undermine Vargas and his historical route, instead of doing something as extreme of restoring a monarchy, let's go down something a bit easier and just replacing him with a much more democratically aligned candidate. This begins by repealing the national security laws to ensure that somebody like Vargas won't be able to um, take advantage of some laws and national security to uh, create another state of emergency and solidify their control. And thus Armando becomes the leader, who doesn't look the happiest guy in the world, but I'm sure he's somewhat happy, right? Becomes leader of Brazil, is miserable. The immediate concern with going with the democratic branch is dealing with the military, who are going to overthrow um, your newly established kind of government, which, oh my goodness, isn't this such a parallel to like, <laughs> so many um, real situations that are still happening in today's society. You have democratic elections, you think they're independent and the candidate is going to be supported, and then the military intervenes and the democratic facade is completely torn down. So, you know, it's interesting that the Brazilian focus tree is also going to be mirroring some of that very true historical systems. The manner in which you choose to deal with it can be split down two paths, greater federalism, or promoting centralization. Federalism will be about making sure that each of your states, and remember there are a lot more states in Brazil with the new update, have their distinct identities as opposed to promote centralization where basically all power is going to be on the southeast coast. Following down the federalist path will also include implementing a national guard, um, opening some social sort of policies including opening up political discourse, as well as nationalizing the banks. Or alternatively, instead of trying to undermine the military, you can try and make concessions to them, such as reaching out to the military establishment and giving them ministerial posts. This will also slightly shift the economic policy of your country to be more internal as well as more traditional in its outlook. Regardless of which path you took, all roads will eventually lead to addressing the labor disputes, which is about getting your country on track for the imminent World War II situation that pretty much everybody is going to find themselves in. Side note, I see a focus there called the United States of Brazil. Do you think that actually makes your country called the United States of Brazil? Or is that just the name of the focus? As a newly found democratic nation, you can take advantage of the fact that many of the majors in the game are also democratic. Um, so with Invite Foreign Corporations, you can use the MIOs, which came with Arms Against Tyranny, to start getting some cheaper equipment from them such as tanks and planes. Or if you want a much more traditional focus, we have war bonds, which gives you consumer goods factory reduction and war support. This is like a focus that was pulled straight out of the vanilla game way back from its release. Although to be fair, it's 35 days. I think the original DLCs, if you found a focus that wasn't 70 days, it was like one in a hundred. And so with Brazil democratic and ready for war, you now have access to the good neighbor policies, which are the joining the allies side of the foreign policy options. The good neighbor policy branch is actually the shared historical branch. So this is the historical path that Brazil is taking, but there are focuses inside of here that are alt history. So not everything in here you just have to do in a historical playthrough. For example, there is the focus reach out to our neighbors, which allows you to create your own faction. So even though this is the sort of joining the allies branch, it may be it's better to just say you're more allied aligned because you can make your own faction in this section. Do note though, there is no decisions to invite people to your faction, unlike with the other one. So 
I don't know, the utility here is finite maybe? Democracies can't conquer people, democracies really struggle to puppet people, and there's no decisions to invite anyone. And most nations are more often than not going to want to join the allies over your faction. As in, that's like an actual debuff that some nations have, where they won't join your faction because they want to join the allies. Maybe a bit of an oversight with that, but we'll see how it plays out when it releases, I suppose. Ah, and here we go, the United States of South America at the bottom of the fo- Hold on a second, was there a focus earlier and I asked this exact question? One sec, one sec, I need to go back. Oh, I'm sorry, the United States of Brazil, right. Sorry, there's two United States focuses in this, very similar, but they are different, to be fair. Okay, so the United States of South America, I guess to combat the United States of North America. So we're not quite sure what the requirements are for you to be able to take this focus, but let's just read the wording for a second. Unlocks the decisions to invite democratic or non-aligned faction members to merge with your republic. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, that focus to create your own faction doesn't have the options to invite people listed in it. Maybe there is the ability to do that, and I don't know, but as far as I can see, there isn't. So if you can't invite people to your faction, then how can you use the decisions to merge them into your United States of South America? It may be the case that it's worth joining the allies simply so that you can merge with different countries who also join the allies in South America. But by Jove, if you manage to achieve it, there we see it in its full strength. The United States of South America. It would be funny if <laughs> there was also the United States in the North got renamed as like a hidden thing to the United States of North America because otherwise it's just going to get confusing. I jest, I jest, they're probably not going to do that, but it could be funny. And finally is the final, 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 final thing of the final path is the communist path. Finally, this is the path we know the least about because it actually doesn't share anything with any other branch. It is entirely independent and basically just lives on its own although it does have some sort of mirroring similarities as we go through it. The communist section of the Dev Diary begins by talking about a little bit of backstory. So as mentioned in the historical Dev Diary, in 35, the communist attempted to overthrow the Vargas government. This Vargas guy, he keeps popping up. He's in the integralist path, he's in the historical path, he's the kind of the enemy of the democratic and the monarchy paths, and now we're trying to overthrow him in the communist path. He gets around, doesn't he? Regardless, they are the central opposition to the Fargus administration, and as such, there can be no compromise. If you're going down the communist path, this is going to induce a civil war, one you're going to need to fight against Mr. Vargas himself, it seems. Before it begins, in traditional Hoi Four fashion, there will be a series of focuses you can take to try and alleviate some of the hardship that the civil war is going to cause you. Taking a look at some of the focuses to prepare you for the civil war, we see this one, boosting communism, stability, and gaining an extra two divisions of militia for when things kick off. We also see Sway the Kangasu to our cause, which is going to be about getting the sort of bandits living in the much more arid rural parts of Brazil and bringing them onto the communist revolutionary cause. With this, we'll get free, <laughs> with this, we'll get free Kangasu bandits to help us in the conflict. Kind of funny to, to the, if, if they get specific bandit units with specific bandit icons that could be kind of a funny focus to take. Alas, the great big Soviet bear is never too far away with this focus involving Frio Presto from prison. Alas, the great Soviet bear is never too far away with this focus where we must free Prestes from prison. Reclaiming him from Vargas's jail will give you a hefty amount of communism, two extra divisions, and I think most importantly, the ability to use um, communist partido as in pro-Soviet advisors after the war. Surely this won't involve you joining the Comintern at the end of it, right? Surely. And lo here we can see the civil war in all of its, oh I was going to say glory there. Do I really want to say a civil war is glorious? Okay let's not say glorious. Here we can see the civil war in reality as it were. Um, you are the northern side and the southern side is what you're going to be going towards, so marching towards Rio de Janeiro. Some key things to remember here are of course the state changes, so there's probably going to be more victory points, and that the Amazon rainforest is now non-navigable, apart from down the rivers. Also, am I slightly perturbed, or does it look like um, Brazil just shoots into Peru far more than it used to? I know that Ecuador now owns this state, 
which people think is kind of controversial because they still maintain that Peru owned it. It's just that Ecuador stepped over the line, so far as I understand it. But yes, in terms of the actual conflict, these are the lines, and it seems they've stuck the majority of their units on this border here to push for Rio. Was Bolivia always called the Bolivian Republic? Aren't they just called Bolivia? Is this an alt history game, or is this a new change, do we think? I'm not sure. With the Civil War I, with all of its funky new states, you have the ability to choose three different paths which you want to go down. Three. Not necessarily two. Hold your horses, everyone. So, option number one, join the Soviet Union. We know that one, we've seen it before. Option number two, prevent a personality cult. That's basically the going your own way, forming our own faction. We know that one. And there's a third one. The Kangasu can do a coup of their own. Does this mean a bandit uprising? Oh goodness me, I do believe it means a bandit revolution. Um, the Kangasu can rise up and you can get, oh, how is that name pronounced? Lampiao? As a bandit revolutionary, giving you a good population factor, 20% war support. This is not quite the communist government I think we were expecting in this path. Ah yes, which way do you pick? Do you pick standard looking random guy? or absolutely huge bandit man with gigantic hat. I don't think there's any competition here who wins this portrait battle. For the next section, we don't actually get too much information on any of the focuses going forward from here, so it's kind of up to me to just do some thinking about it. So on the left, we have the Soviet branch, where you're probably going to get some um, civs or some bonuses through the Soviets, and then you can choose between getting tanks directly from them or just the licenses for them before they eventually probably give you some mills. In the center, this is most likely going to be a agency, the EICI, which will allow you to start swaying the neighbors to turn them communist to eventually probably join your faction. This is probably a research slot. I'm unsure if this side is gonna be accessible by the Soviet side, the nationalization of the industry, but it's definitely gonna be available to the two others, including the bandits, which is gonna be about, you know, repairing the industry, building up some agricultural stuff, building some railways, and choosing between if you want to be an atheist state or you're going to kind of accept the position of Christianity because Catholicism is so like deeply ingrained into kind of Brazilian life. And because Brazil doesn't have access to a foreign policy tree, they have their own, you know, small Babino version of a policy tree here. So expand the revolution is the foundational focus, which gives you recruitable population factors, supply consumption, and some nice division attack. Um, it's finite though, it doesn't last forever, but it basically lasts for like, at the time that you take this focus, it's probably lasting you for the rest of your campaign. After that, we have the central decision between joining the common turn or going alone. It is important to note that previously we had the picking the communist aligned guy and taking advantage of the Soviet Union, but it doesn't say that you can not then just abandon the Soviet Union and go your own way. So maybe it is possible to take advantage of the Soviet Union buffs, but then not join the common turn and go your own way which would be like a nice change from how they usually do it. This is, this is to my mind, a really positive change if that's possible. And finally, at the bottom, I think it probably goes without saying that these focuses are going to involve conquering the majority of South America. Um, this is for Peru and Venezuela, and this is probably getting rid of the people in like Suriname and um, Guinea, or is it Guyana? And this is probably to deal with the Democrats ending South American capitalism. So yeah, this is the unification so that you can form the UL, ASR. This isn't everything, however, because there's what appears to be a unique mechanic that as you continue to grow as a communist South America, the major nations, specifically the United States, are not really going to be a fan of a giant communist nation at their back door. Something, something Operation Condor. And so with the focused Jaguar diplomacy, you'll have an option to create decisions to establish non-aggression pacts with them probably with some concessions required too. Hopefully with some Jaguar diplomacy, you're able to unify South America as a communist without having, you know, the United States smashing in your front door <laughs> and warships at Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, that's a, that could be a trial of uh, elite, allegiance. I, I said the DLC name, sorry. And low here we can see the Union of Latin American Socialist Republics. It's kind of interesting that they didn't choose to unite with everybody when they took the screenshot. They just did Peru, Bolivia, and Paraguay. This screenshot almost seems more realistic for the democratic path because maybe they went after Peru 
and Paraguay because they have non-democratic aligned ideologies. This is what I actually imagine the United States of South America looking like because how are you going to get the ability to conquer or join with any of these other nations with the democratic path? Sorry, I'm talking about the communist path, I'm getting waylaid. And to cap this week's dev diary, we look at some of the art for some different generals, field marshals and admirals. Many different hats on display here. Nobody can complain about the lack of hats. I'm seeing white hats, green hats, black hats and blue hats. We see a couple of portraits for some leaders. There's Vargas, the, the man whose name appears a thousand times and also a man with an excellent moustache. My goodness, who is his barber? I need to know. And then at the very bottom, a series of political advisors. But as we of course don't know what all of their buffs are, it's ever difficult to figure out who's good and who's bad. But uh, let's just say there's a lot of them, including a coffee king. And with that, that ends this week's dev diary. So that's basically it. That's all of the focus trees seen, covered and done. Now you can decide which one looks most exciting, which one are you most excited to play? These are all the questions because, well, I guess it's only two weeks away now. When it comes to Brazil, I'm personally most excited to figure out which of the paths are going to be the easiest and actually fastest. Which are going to be the fastest ones to unify South America? Because once I've done that, I have the ability to go do everything else I want across the entire globe. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I really only have two, I don't know, criticisms, pieces of feedback that immediately spring to mind. One is that I'm unsure if the democratic nations have the ability to invite other people uh, in South America to their faction. And I'm a little sad that Brazil can't become the inheritor of the fifth empire for sake creating a faction and going like a massive world conquest domination, uh, Brazil number one, Brazil will rule the world kind of gameplay. That personally is my only disappointment. But other than that, I'm pretty happy with everything. So tell me, what are you excited for? What are you looking forward to? This is where this video ends, so I'll say thank you very much for watching. If you liked, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you all next week. Bye!